Howdy, howdy, my fellow gamers, and welcome back to another episode of Storytime with Freak. Today, as we finish part three of Neil Shusterman's The Toll, we're about halfway through the book, which is both awesome, because that means that we have plenty more to read, and both depressing, because that means I have a whole lot more to edit. But, without further ado, let us just dive right on in to chapter 30, Burnt Offering. Hello, Tiger. Hi, said Tiger Salazar's memory construct. Do I know you? Yes and no, said Scythe Rand. I've come to tell you that Scythe Lucifer has been caught. Scythe Lucifer? Isn't that the one who's been killing the other Scythes? It is, said Rand. And you know him. Doubt it, said the construct. I know some twisted people, but nobody that twisted. It's your friend, Rowan Damish. The construct paused and laughed. Nice try, it said. Did Rowan put you up to this? Rowan, it called. Where are you hiding? Come on out. He's not here. Don't try to tell me that he's killing people. He never even got to be a scythe. They booted his ass out and gave it to that girl instead. He's going to be executed tomorrow, Rand said. And the construct hesitated, furrowed its brow. They were so well programmed, these constructs. They compiled the memories of every facial expression of the subject that had ever been recorded. The representation was sometimes so true to life, it was unnerving. You're not kidding, are you? said Tiger's construct. Well, you can't let it happen. You have to stop it. It's out of my hands. Then put it back in your hands. I know Rowan better than anyone. If he did what you say he did, then he had a good reason. You can't just glean him. Then the construct began looking around as if it was aware it was in a limited world, a virtual box that it wanted to get out of. It's wrong, it said. You can't do this. What do you know about right and wrong, snapped Rand. You're nothing but a foolish, dim-witted party boy. It glared at her in fury, the micropixels of its image increasing the percentage of red in its face. I hate you, it said. Whoever the hell you are, I hate you. Aang quickly hit the button and ended the conversation. Tiger's memory construct vanished. As always, it would not remember this conversation. As always, Aang would. If you're going to glean him, why not just glean him? Scythran asked Goddard, doing her best not to sound as frustrated as she was. There were many reasons for her frustration. First of all, a stadium was a difficult venue to secure for their enemies. And they did have enemies. Not just the old guard Scythes, but everyone from the Tonists to Scythems who had shunned Goddard to the disgruntled loved ones from mass gleanings. It was just the two of them in Goddard's private plane. Now that the motorcade was nearing its destination, after nearly a week of running through its prolonged victory lap, he and Rand were flying to meet it, a flight as short as Rowan Damish's journey was long. Like Goddard's rooftop chalet, the plane was retrofitted with mortal age weaponry, a series of missiles that hung from each wing. He would regularly fly low over communities that he deemed defiant. He never used the missiles to glean, but just like rooftop cannons, they were a reminder that if he could, if he chose to. If you want a public display, Ayn suggested, make the gleaning more controlled. Maybe a broadcast from a small, undisclosed location. Why do you have to make a spectacle of everything? Because I enjoy spectacles, and there's no reason to go beyond that. But of course, there was a bigger reason. Goddard wanted the world to know that he had personally apprehended and executed the greatest public enemy of the post-mortal age. Not only to raise Goddard's image among common people, but to gain the admiration of sites who might be on the fence about him. Everything Goddard was either strategic or impulsive. This grand event was strategic. Turning the gleaning of Rao and Damish into a show would make it impossible for anyone to ignore. There will be over a thousand scythes from around the world in that audience, Goddard reminded her. They wish to see it, and I wish to provide it. Who are we to deny them? Catharsis. Rand had no idea what that meant and didn't really care. Goddard spouted erudite garbage with such regularity, Rand had learned to turn her ears off of most of it. There are better ways to handle this, Rand said. Now Goddard's expression began to sour. They hit a small pocket of turbulence, which Goddard probably believed was brought on by his mood. And are you trying to tell me how to be a scythe? Or worse, how to be an overblade? How can I tell you how to do something that didn't exist until you made it up? <clears throat> Careful, Ain, he warned. Don't anger me at a time. I should be feeling nothing but joy. He let his mourning sink in, then leaned back in his chair. I would think you, of all people, would love to see Rowan suffer after what he did to you. He broke your back. He left you for dead. And you want his gleaning to be a small, quiet thing? I want him gleaned just as much as you do, but gleaning should not be entertainment. To which Goddard said with an infuriating grin, It's entertaining to me. As Scythe Lucifer, Rowan had been very careful to make sure the scythes he ended never suffered. They were gleaned quickly. It was only after they were dead that he burned the bodies to render them unrevivable. It didn't surprise him that Goddard was lacking in such mercy. Rowan's agony would be prolonged for maximum effect. There was only so much bravado that Rowan could muster. As the execution motorcade wove its way to his doom, he finally had to admit to himself that he truly did care about whether he lived or died. And while it didn't bother him how history might remember him, he was troubled by how his family would. His mother and his many brothers and sisters must already know that he was Scythe Lucifer, because once blame for the sinking of Endura was foisted upon him, it made Rowan infamous. The crowds that turned out to get a glimpse of the motorcade was proof of that. 
Would his family be there in the audience? If not, would they be watching from home? What happened to the families of notorious criminals back in mortal days, he wondered, for there was no equivalent to Scythe Lucifer in post-mortal times. Would they have been damned by association and gleaned? Rowan's father had been gleaned before Endura sank, so he never knew what his son had become and how the world hated him. There was a mercy in that. But if his mother and siblings were still alive, they must have despised him, for how could they not? That realization was more demoralizing than anything else. He had plenty of time to be alone with his own thoughts during the motorcade's winding journey. His thoughts were not his friends, at least not anymore, because all they did was remind him of the choices he had made, and how they had led him there. What once felt justified now felt foolhardy. What once seemed brave now just seemed sad. It could have been different. He could have just disappeared like Scythe Faraday when he had the chance. Where was Faraday now, he wondered. Would he be streaming the event and weeping for him? It would be nice to know that someone wept for him. Citra would, wherever she was. That would have to be enough. The gleaning was scheduled for 7 in the evening, but people had arrived early. There were sights and ordinary citizens in the crowd, and although the sights did have a special entrance, they had been encouraged by Goddard to sit among the rabble. And this is a golden public relations opportunity, Goddard had told them. Smile and say kind things. Listen attentively to their twaddle and pretend to care. Maybe even grant some immunity. Many followed the directive. Some could not bring themselves to and sat only with other sights. Rowan, under heavy guard, was taken directly to a large staging area with access directly onto the field. The woodpile they had prepared for him was a three-story pyramid that appeared to be made of gathered branches, like a random collection of stacked driftwood, but closer inspection proved everything to be part of an intricately engineered design. The branches weren't just stacked, but nailed in place, and that whole thing was on a huge rolling platform like a parade float. The very center was hollowed out, and in the hollow was a stone pillar to which Rowan was tightly secured by fire-resistant bindings. The pillar was on a lift that would raise Rowan to the top of the pyramid, revealing him to the crowd at the right moment. Then Goddard himself would light it. This baby is not your ordinary pyre, explained the tech in charge as he wandered off <coughs> Rowan's pain nanites. I was part of the team that designed this beauty. There are actually four kinds of wood here. Ash, wood for an even burn. Osage orange for heat. Rowan wood for, well, obvious reasons. And a few pockets of naughty pine for a nice crackle. The tech checked out the tweaker's readout, confirming that Rowan's pain nanites had been shut down, then got back to explaining the wonders of the death float like a kid at the science fair. Oh, you're going to love this, he said. The branches on the outer rim have been treated with potassium salts, so they'll burn violet, and then further up, it's calcium chloride, so they'll burn blue, and so on and so forth through all the colors of the spectrum. And then he pointed at the black robe at the guards that had forcibly put Rowan in, and that robe has been infused with stonethium chloride, so it burns deep red. You'll be better than New Year's Eve fireworks. Gee, thanks, Rowan said politely. Too bad I won't get to see it. Oh, you will, the tech said cheerily. There's an exhaust fan built into the base that will suck out all the smoke away, so everyone will get a good view, even you. Then he took out a piece of brown cloth. This is a gun cotton gag, the tech told him. It's a quick burning, and it'll incinerate right off the moment it's exposed to heat. Then he stopped himself, finally realizing that Rowan didn't need to know or want to know these things. A quick burning gag that allowed people to hear him scream was not the kind of accessory he would get enthused about. Now Rowan was glad they hadn't offered him a last meal because he was way too nauseated to have held it down. Behind the tech, Scythe ran and entered the snarl of branches. Even the prospect of her was better than a blow-by-blow -blow des description of his dazzling incineration. You're not here to talk to him, Rand snapped. Immediately the tech caved like a skull pup. Yes, Your Honor, I'm sorry, Your Honor. <clears throat> Give me the gag and get lost. Yes, Scythe ran, sorry again. Anyway, he's good to go. He gave her a thumbs up. She grabbed the gag and he retreated with a shoulder's hunch. How much longer? Rowan asked Rand. It's about to start, she told him. A few speeches and you're on. Rowan found he had no heart left to banter with her. He could not be cavalier about this anymore. Will you watch, he asked, or look away? He didn't know why he cared, but he did. Rand didn't answer him and said she said, I'm not sorry to see you die, Rowan, but I'm annoyed by how it's going down. Frankly, I just wanted to be over. So do I, he told her. I'm trying to figure out if it's worse knowing what's going to happen or if it would have been better not to know. He took a moment and asked, Did Tiger know? She took a step back from him. I'm not letting you play your little head games on me anymore, Rowan. No games, he said honestly. I just want to know. Did you tell him what was happening to him before you took his body? Did he at least have a few moments to make peace with it? No, she told him. He never knew. He thought he was about to be ordained as a scythe, then we put him under, and that was that. Rowan nodded, kind of like dying in his sleep. What? That's how they say all mortals wanted to go, in their sleep, peacefully, without ever knowing. I guess it makes sense. Rowan supposed he said too much because Rowan, Rand put the gag on and tightened it. Once the flames reach you, she had to breathe them in, she told him. It will go faster for you if you do. Then she left without looking back. Anne could not get the image of Rowan Damish out of her head. She'd seen him incapacitated before, tied up, tied down, shackled and restrained any number of ways. But this time it was different. He wasn't plucky or defiant, he was resigned. He didn't look like the shrewd killing machine Goddard had turned him into. He looked like exactly what he was, a frightened boy who got in over his head. Well, 
Serves him right, Ain thought, trying to shake it off. What goes around comes around. Isn't that what mortals used to say? As she walked out onto the field, a wind swooped through the bowl of the stadium, fluttering her robe. The stands were just about full now, more than 1,000 sites and 30,000 citizens, a capacity crowd. Rand sat beside Goddard and his undersides. Constantine would not miss the gleaning of Rao and Damish, but he didn't seem any more pleased by this than Ain did. Are you enjoying yourself, Constantine? Goddard asked, clearly to goad him. I recognize the importance of an event around which to rally the public and present a unified North America, Constantine said. It's a strong strategy, and one that is likely to mark a turning point in Scythe Affairs. It was complimentary, but didn't answer the question. A perfectly diplomatic response. Goddard read through it, though, as Ain knew he would, picking up on Constantine's disapproval. You are nothing if not consistent, Goddard told him. Constantine the Consistent. I do believe that is how history will come to know you. <laughs> there are worse attributes, Constantine told him. Did you at least extend a personal invitation to our friends in Texas to attend, Goddard asked? I did. They didn't respond. No, I expect they wouldn't. Shame. I would have much liked to see them that the family they've chosen to exclude themselves from. The agenda for the evening had the four other North American High Blades given speeches, each one carefully written to hit a certain point that Goddard wanted to hit. High Blade Hammerstein of East America would lament the many souls lost on Endora, and the other unlikely sites brutally ended by Scythe Lucifer. High Blade Pickford of West America would talk about North American unity and how the alliance of five out of six North American Scythedoms made life better for everyone. High Blade Tezak of Mexiteca would invoke the Mortal Age, point out how far the world had come, and leave the audience with a veiled warning to other Scythems that not aligning with Goddard could bring back the bad old days. High Blade MacPhail of the Northern Reach would give credit to all those involved in putting this event together. She would also highlight members of the audience, Scythes and ordinary people as well, whose favor was worth currying. And then finally, Goddard would deliver an address that would wrap it all up with a nice bow before he set the pyre ablaze. <clears throat> This will not just be the gleaning of a public enemy, he had told Ain in his undersight. It's a bottle of champagne smashed upon a ship. This shall mark the christening of a new time for the human race. It was as if Goddard looked upon it religiously, a burnt offering to purify the path and appease the gods. As far as Goddard was concerned, this day was just as important as the day he revealed himself at Conclave and accepted his nomination for High Blade. Even more important because of the Reach, the event would stream out to billions, not just a gathering of scythes in a Conclave. The reverberations of tonight would be felt for a long, long time, and the Scythems that had yet to align with him would have little choice but to do so. Support was growing in leaps and bounds now that he was focused on gleaning on the margins of society. Ordinary citizens had no great love of the fringe anyway, and as long as one wasn't part of that frayed edge that needed trimming, one needn't worry about gleaning in Goddard's world. Of course, with the population ever growing, there was no shortage of people to push to the margins. It was, he had come to realize, a matter of evolution. Not natural selection, because nature had become weak and toothless. Intelligence selection was more like it, with Goddard and his acolytes at the helm of the intelligentsia. As the hour neared seven and the sky became dark, Goddard cracked his knuckles repeatedly and bounced his knees, <clears throat> his body expressing a youthful impatience that he didn't show on his face. Ain put a hand on his knee to stop the motion. Goddard resented it, but obliged. Then the lights in the stands dimmed and brightened on the field as the pyre began to roll out from the bullpen. The anticipation of the crowd was palpable. Not so much cheers and whoops as gasps and a building rumble. Even unlit, this pyre was a sight to behold. The way its branches caught the light, a dead forest woven for an artist's eye. A lit torch waited a safe distance, ready to be touched to the corner of the pyre by Goddard at the proper moment. As the other speeches began, Goddard ran his own speech through his mind. He had studied the greatest addresses in history, those of Roosevelt, King, Dissamines, Churchill. This would be short and sweet, but full of quotable moments, and the kind that would be engraved in stone. The kind that would become iconic and timeless, like those he had studied. He would take the torch, light the fire, and as the flames grew, he would recite Scythe Socrates' poem, Ode to the Ageless. A world anthem, if ever there was one. Hammerstein's speech began. He was perfectly mournful and lubricious. Pickford was regal and eloquent. Tizoc direct and incisive, and MacPhail's gratitude for those who had made this day possible felt honest and real. Goddard rose and approached the pyre. He wondered if Rowan knew the honor that Goddard had was bestowing on him today, cementing his place in history. From now until the end of all things, the world would know his name. He'd be studied by school children everywhere. Today he would die, yet in a very real sense, he would also become immortal, belonging to the ages in a way that few are. Goddard touched the bottom and button and lift raised. Goddard touched the button and li the lift raised Rowan from the within the pyre to its peak. The rumble of the crowd grew. People stood, hands pointed. Goddard began. Honorable scythes and respected citizens, today we commit humanity's last criminal to the cleansing fire of history. Rowan Damish, who called himself Scythe Lucifer, stole the light of so many. But today, we take that light back. 
and use it as a clear and ever-present beacon of our future. There was a tap on his shoulder. He almost didn't feel it. A new age where scythes with measured joy shape our great society, gleaning those who have no place in our glorious tomorrow. Again, a tap at his shoulder, more insistent this time. Could it be that someone was interrupting his address? Who would dare do such a thing? He turned to see Constantine behind him, upstaging him with that eye-assaulting crimson robe, even more gaudy now that it wore rubies. Your Excellency, he whispered, there appears to be a problem. A problem in the middle of my speech, Constantine. Uh, you should look for yourself. Then Constantine drew his attention to the pyre. Rowan squirmed and strained against his bonds. He tried to scream through the gag, but the screams would not be fully realized until the gag burned off, and then Goddard realized the figure atop the unlit pyre was not Rowan. The face was familiar, but it wasn't until Goddard looked to the giant screens placed around the stadium which showed the man's anguished expression close up that he realized who it was. It was the technician, the one in charge of preparing Rowan for his execution. Ten minutes earlier, before the pyre was rolled out, Rowan tried to relish his moments remaining in his life. Then a trio of scythes approached him, weaving through the forest of branches. None of their robes were familiar, nor were their faces. This visit was not on the program, and all things considered, Rowan was relieved to see them, because if they were here to exact personal revenge on him, unwilling to wait for him to burn, it would be an easier end. Sure enough, one of them pulled out a knife and swung it toward them. He braced for the sharp pain and the quick extinguishing of consciousness, but it didn't come. And it was only after the blade cut the bonds on his hands that he realized it was a bowie knife. Chapter 31. Damage Control Goddard felt his body's reaction before his mind could truly grasp what he was seeing. It came as a tingling in his extremities, a churning in his gut, and an aching tightness in the small of his back. Fury surged upward with volcanic intensity until only his head began to throb. Everyone in the stadium already knew what he had only just now seen, that the prisoner at the peak of the pyre was not Scythe Lucifer. For over the past three years, the world had come to know Rowan Damish's face. Yet this was the face being broadcast in stream. It filled the expansive screens all around Goddard as if to mic him. His grand moment was not just robbed from him, it was subverted, twisted upon itself like something obscene. The rumbles from the audience sounded different than they had only a second ago. Was that laughter he heard? Were they laughing at him? Whether they were or not was of little consequence. All that matters was what he heard, what he felt, and he felt derision of 30,000 souls. It could not stand. This monstrant moment could not be suffered to live. Constantine whispered in his ear, I've ordered the gates locked and the entire blade guard has been alerted. We'll find him. But that didn't matter. It was ruined. They could have dragged Rowan back and hurl him onto the pyre, but it would make no difference. Goddard's shining moment would be the greatest casualty of the day. Unless, unless, Aang knew things were headed to be a very bad place the moment she saw the imbecile atop the pyre. Goddard would have to be handled. For when his anger took control, all bets were off. It was bad enough before, but ever since acquiring Tiger's body, those youthful impulses, the sudden Anderson surges, gave Goddard a terrible new dimension. Adrenaline and testosterone must have been charming when managed by a harmless blank slate like Tiger Salazar, they were merely winds beneath the kite. But under Goddard, whose same winds were a tornado, which meant he would have to be handled, like a beast that had been broken out of its cage. She let Constantine be the one to run out to him and deliver the bad news, because Goddard loved to blame the messenger, so better Constantine than her. Only after Goddard had turned to look at the helpless tech did Aang go to him. The feeds have been cut, Aang told him. It's no longer stream. We're on damage control now. You can turn this around, Robert. She said, cajoling him as best she could. Make them think this is intentional. Think that it's part of the show. The look on his face terrified her. She wasn't even sure he'd heard her until he said, intentional. Yes, Aang, that's exactly what I'll do. He raised the mic and Aang stepped back. Perhaps Constantine had been right. It was always in those moments of dismay that she could corral him, control him, fix what was spoken before it became irreparable. She took a deep breath and waited along with everyone else to hear what he was going to say. Today was meant to be a day of reckoning. Goddard began spitting the words into the microphone as he spoke. You! All of you who came here today nurturing a thirst for blood. You! Whose hearts quicken at the prospect of a man being burned alive before your very eyes. You! Did you think I would indulge you? Did you believe we scythes were so base as to pander to your morbid curiosity? Offering you a circus of carnage for your entertainment? Now he screamed at them through dinner and teeth. How dare you! Only scythes may take pleasure in the ending of life. Or have you forgotten? He paused, letting that sink in, letting them feel the depth of their transgression. Had Rowan not vanished, he would have been happy to give them their show. But they must never know that. No, Scythe Lucifer is not here today, he continued. But you, who were so eager to witness the spectacle, are now the object of my eye. This was not a judgment on him. It was a judgment on you. Who have, on this day, damned yourselves. The only way back from perdition is penance. Penance and sacrifice. Therefore, I have selected you on this day to be an example for the world. Then he looked to the thousands of sites dotting the audience of the stadium. Glean them, he ordered, with contempt for the crowd so great that he bit his own lip. Glean them all. 
The panic was slow to build. Stupefied people looked to one another. Did the Overblade actually say that? He couldn't have said it. He couldn't have meant it. Even the sights were unsure at first, but an order could not be refused if one didn't want their loyalty questioned. Bit by bit, weapons were pulled out, and the sights began to look at the people around them with a very different expression than they had before, calculating how best to achieve the goal. I am your completion, proclaimed Goddard as he did all his mask leanings, his voice echoing throughout the stadium. I am the last word of your unsatisfied, unsavory lives. The first people began to run, then a few more, and then it was as if a floodgate had opened. The panicked spectators climbed over seats and over one another to get to the exits, but Scythes had quickly positioned themselves in the neck of the funnel. The only way past them was through them, and the gleaned were already beginning to block the narrow paths to freedom. I am your deliverer. I am your portal to the mysteries of oblivion. People began hurling themselves over railing, hoping that splatting before they would glean would save them, but this was a scythe action. From the moment Goddard gave the order, the Thunderhead was helpless to intervene. All it could do was watch through its many unblinking eyes. I am your Omega, your bringer of infinite peace. You will embrace me. Scythe ran, begged him to stop, but he pushed her away, and she tumbled to the ground, knocking over the torch. It glanced across the edge of the pyre, and that's all it took. The pyre ignited, purple flames rushing up around the best. Your death is both my verdict upon you and my gift to you, Goddard told the dying crowd. Accept it with grace, and thus, farewell. The best view of Goddard's Armageddon was from the top of the pyre, and with the smoke drawn away by the exhaust fans below, the tech could see everything, including the outer rim of purple flame which had moved up the pyre, turning blue. In the stands, the scythes, each glittering with jewels embedded in their new order robes, dispatched their victims at an alarming rate. I will not be alone today, thought the tech as the flames drew closer, burning from green to bright yellow. He could feel the soles of his shoes beginning to melt. He could smell the burning rubber. The fire was orange now and closer. The screams all around him from the stands seemed far, far away. Soon the flames would turn red, the gun cotton gag would burn away from him, and his own screams would be the only ones that mattered. Then he saw a lone scythe looking in his direction from the field, the one in the crimson robe, one of the few scythes who had not gone after the crowd. They locked eyes for a moment. Then, just as the flames caught the doomsman's pant leg, Scythe Constantine raised a pistol and performed the only gleaning he would do today, a single shot through the heart that spared the tech from a more painful end. And the last thought of the tech had before his life left him was a wave of immense gratitude for the crimson scythe's mercy. I will forgive you for trying to stop me, Goddard said to Scythe Rand as their limousine pulled away from the stadium. But it surprises me, Ain, that you of all people would flinch when it came to gleaning. Ain could have said a million things to him, but she held her tongue. Rowan was already forgotten, trampled beneath this large affair. Rumor was that he had been seen leaving the stadium with Scythe Travis and several other Texan Scythes. She could blame all this on them, but who was she kidding? She was the one who suggested Goddard find a way to make Rowan's absence appear like part of a larger plan. But she never imagined where Goddard would take it. That was not the event I asked for, but rarely do things come the way we expect, Goddard said in a calm and collected way. Someone might discuss a stage play. Even so, this day has worked to our advantage. Ren looked at him in disbelief. How? How can you say that? Isn't it obvious? And when she didn't respond, he elucidated with the smooth eloquence that he was famous for. Fear, Ain. Fear is the beloved father of respect. The common citizens must know their place. They must be aware of the lines they may not cross. Without the Thunderhead in their lives, they need a firm hand to give them stability, to set clear boundaries. They will revere me, and all my sights will not run afoul of us again. He thought about his own self-serving rationalizations and nodded approval in himself. All is well, Ain. All is well. But Scythe Rand knew from this moment on, nothing would be well again. And that is the end of part three, guys. When next we pick it up, we will pick up at chapter 32 with a New Testament and also part four. So thank you all so much for listening and hanging out with us today. Don't forget, if you haven't already, to go check out our new t-shirt design on designbyhumans.com. Uh, magnificent job. I love it. Can't wait to pick one up for myself and do an episode in it. Uh, our topic of the day would be... What's your favorite fast food place? Let me know in the comments down below. Feel free to check the links out down below. And as always, stay freaky.